so you've been um, you've been an artist, a conceptual sculptor. Yeah. And um, what the, I can't make anything. That's one of the. Well, it's not. That's not really true. It's not that I can't make anything. I hate making things. Uh, I, I haven't got the patience. It's one of the reasons I'm a sleight of hand artist, because I'm fine with practicing for a thousand hours, but I'm not fine with waiting ten minutes for the glue to dry before I take the tape off. Well, you're clearly you're using the wrong glue. <laughs> no doubt you could uh, school me in that regard. Um, and you have these incredible maker skills, unbelievable skills. I mean, it's one of the first things when I first started watching this maker, this, this bus, that thing. Uh, no, first of all, I started watching this one, I was like, how do these, these guys learn to do all this stuff? Were they well bold and they, what the hell? I need to learn that. And, um, but what I, what I find really interesting is the intersection of those very practical building skills with your art. And you are interested, among other things, and some people here probably sure know this, uh, but some people probably don't. You're interested in, I guess, what might be called Manufactured artifacts? Is that a, is that a fair term? No, I, it actually all centers on objects. I, okay. I love objects. I love, uh, actually, I, the phrase I came up with years ago is the narrative of objects. Right, and not every object has a narrative. It's not random no, objects. Not it's not that object, microphone. Not every object has an interesting narrative. Fair enough. Okay. Every, uh, I mean, my, my wedding ring is my wife's grandfather's ring. He happened to be a circus performer. It's a lovely narrative. Yes. Um, when I was seven or eight years old, I discovered an attic room in my grandmother's house that I was allowed to rummage around in. And I found all sorts of really wacky stuff. I found things like my mom's ex-husband's telegraph set, because he was a ham radio hobbyist. I didn't know what a telegraph set was, but this you know, brass and bake light bolted to a wooden board was totally fascinating and actually still informs that large portion of my aesthetic. I, I was steampunk before steampunk or even knew what steampunk was. Um, and so for me, the, the, the making was always a means to having objects that I wanted to have. So I went and saw James Bond movies and I came home and I took one of my dad's old briefcases and I put cardboard and I cut holes out of it and put acetate with uh, like filter paper behind there and flashlight bulbs so I could have my own briefcase with lights and switches. Um, and I'm still doing the same thing. I don't want to buy an R52 when I can spend a few years making one. So I can have it in my office. I have the blade room pistol. I, I, so those making skills have all been the process of either making conceptual art or making myself my own Maltese Falcon or even like figuring out how I want a, 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 a graph to look on the show all come from the same place. They all come from the same desire to have this physical object that pleases me. In right. way. You made a, uh, a replica of the journal that Amy Jones carried. Yeah. And you know, uh, what, one of the things I find really interesting about that, it relates to the dodo skeleton too in a way, is there's no blueprint for that. You made this beautiful, accurate object, but you had to draw the information from the, you know, you there's, no, the there's nobody that tells you, there's no one spot you go to tells you what's in the book. You it's this, it's, it, it, I think it's the identity. And I've seen your loosely folded, yeah. how you accumulate it. Yeah, no, I have, this, so this is uh, Indiana Jones's father's grail diary from the last crusade. And it's a 220 page journal, 180 pages are filled with writing. We only know what's on, we only know. By we, I mean the general prop community only knows what's on about 85% of those pages. I might know what's on some of the others. <laughs> um, and, you know, that was a project that took like two years of slowly photoshopping some scans from books and turning them into printable things and then learning how to do book binding with so many signatures. And if you're going to make one, you might as well make ten because it doesn't take that much more time to make ten of something. It really doesn't. Once right, you've done right, the setup, right. print up ten and make sure. ten. So I made ten and I actually made a few thousand dollars selling nine of them. And the one I have left is mine. Um, but when you say you practice for a few thousand dollars, I mean, I know that when you, you know, you gather a slide from a whole bunch of different sources. You might see someone do it. You might see a film of someone having done it. You might read uh, someone's account of someone do it. None of those is a complete picture. 
Right. None of those is the knowledge of how to do that slide. That's why you have to practice it for a few thousand hours, right? Yes. So that practice, that meditation, is the same thing that I'm doing when I'm inculcating myself with all of the right. pieces of the Grail Diary. I just sit there. It's like I realized I hit a transition a few years ago with making things. I now know how to use all the tools at my shop. I, there's no mystery to me about what to do with a tool once I'm set up at it. So what I do is I spend most of my time building in my head so that when I finally get to the shop, the actual building, because really, like most things, the setup is everything. The use of the, 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 use of the table saw is 1% of using a table saw. This is what Hitchcock said about making movies. You know, you're, you're, you're such a big movie fan, I would expect you to be a Hitchcock I, I this quote. Uh, Well, it's just, that, that's not a single quote, it's just that Hitch did these, because he came up through film, did it doing everything. He started by lettering the, the text signs on silent films. Uh, so he knew how to do everything, and so he was very, very thorough um, about sketching every scene in advance and doing the boards, right, doing the storyboards. And so to him, that was the making of the film, and the actual shooting was was dreadful to him because he hated actors, thought all actors were crazy and stupid, didn't want to work with them. And so to him, the movie was done, the real creative work was in the storyboards, and the, yeah, best well, was just a, the rest was just a chore. It's, just, it's actually the same on our show. Uh, my favorite moments, and we, we've, we've labored, Jamie and I both have labored a lot in our brains about how to get this on film, but our favorite moments of doing the show is plotting out the, the series of experiments we're going to do and why we're going to do them. We can't ever do a complete set of controls and experiments and regulations right. sure. so we have to choose very carefully and arguing between each other about what those story points are and why they're important, which ones we're going to throw out and which ones we're going to put in is the most fun we have. As a fan of the show, I would love to see that once. I mean, I would love to see the one behind the scenes about that. Um, yeah. Because we're always trying to imagine the part that we're not seeing. And in your, in your case, as opposed to most other television, where the part we're not seeing is just, you know, producers and actors being unpleasant. But in your case, we're, what we're not seeing is always interesting. I've been on the set a bunch of times, and the, and the first time I was on the set, you know, despite the fact I haven't seen the show, uh, knowing the show, still it was stunning to me how hard you guys work. I mean, you work unbelievably hard. You think they have, you know, you think they have more people than they do. You, know, you think they have staff? <laughs> Not so much. And uh, you know, got ten people. Yeah, it's amazing. And I and they're all incredibly talented. It's a wonderful set by one of the best I've ever been around. And I've made a lot of television behind the scenes too. And uh, but I was on not the first time, but I was on set for swimming in syrup. <laughs> and you know they got the, they got the steam shovels or whatever, the earth movers rather, and they dug those trenches and laid down those four by eight sheets of plywood and plastic garbage bags. I mean, it's them doing it. Well, it's a, it's a, so there's two reasons that we have a problem filming it. One is, and Sue and Serve is a great example of an episode in which we started out with an idea. God, it's hard to remember all the steps. But basically, the plot of Swimming in Syrup, how many truck, how many runs in syrup versus water there would be, by who. Right. The plot of that show changed every day for eight days. And all right through the shooting. All the days we were shooting. Uh, every day we'd finish and we'd go, crap. Okay, it turns out that Jamie hates swimming in syrup, so we've we got to throw him out. So we've got to throw him out, so now Adam will do all the tests. And then we learned that the the thickness of this isn't working, or the we want to do two tests side by side, we can toss that out, but then there's the order of like, it takes four hours to make a full batch of syrup, we only have the guar gum, even though we're, you know, it thickens water very efficiently, it's costing us tens of thousands of dollars to right. thicken each pool, so we have to figure out what our, what our And you had something that was technically syrup, but actually didn't look so much like syrup. Right, so. right, right. We couldn't just keep on emptying the pools every day and filling them with something new that was convenient. We actually had to leapfrog experiments on the other. So we shot a lot out of order. And we're trying to shoot out of order and still come up with a cohesive step-by-step -step process. And then in the end, that wonderful guy, Nathan H. I was there. He does the swim and he the gold turns medal swimmer. Which when he comes out of the tent, he, comes he out takes his robe off and he's got the gold medal on it, and you go, okay, this is not the same species. No, he's like a Navi. Yeah. He's like six and a half right. feet tall and 
yeah. he's like four feet wide, yeah. and he's got this big, beautiful smile, and he's like the apple pie. Yeah. Yeah. But, but with no attitude. That was the thing. He was completely yeah, no, innocent no and, and, and no attitude at all. And then he gets into our, he, first he gets into our water pool and freaks out because he's never, he doesn't swim in cold water. <laughs> So he gets in our water and it's like six degrees and he's like, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. and then they put him in the syrup. Oh, this is the other one. He right? was running between runs into the hot tub, right? Yeah, we had a hot we had a hot tub on set just to keep ourselves warm. 